Thank you for joining us. My name is Audrey Hassan, patient liaison for the MDS Foundation, and I'll be moderating the presentation today. As we get started, I would like to thank Acceleron, Bristol Myers Squibb, Gamita Cell, Jazz, Novartis, and Takeda for supporting this webinar program. Please note that this is a pre recorded presentation, so the presenter will not be taking any questions. The live questions with answers opportunities for all participants are included at the end of this presentation. Today's presenter is Dr. Rami Kamrachi, Vice Chair of the Malignant Hematology Department and the Head of the Leukemia and MDS Section at Moffitt Cancer Center. He is a senior member of the Malignant Hematology and Experimental Therapeutics Program at the Center and a professor in medicine and oncologic sciences at the College of Medicine at the University of South Florida in Tampa, Florida. After earning a medical degree in 1996 from the Jordan University School of Medicine, Dr. Kamrachi completed an internship and residency at Case Western University St. Vincent program. He then completed a fellowship at Strong Memorial Hospital, University of Rochester in hematology oncology and hemopoietic stem cell transplantation. He has authored and or co-authored more than 220 peer-reviewed manuscripts, 20 book chapters, and more than 500 abstracts in hematologic malignancies. He serves as a member on the MDS panel of the National Comprehensive Cancer Network and the NIH MDS Natural History Study Steering Committee. He was a member of the editorial board for the Journal of Clinical Oncology, and he is a peer reviewer for several medical journals, including the Blood Journal, Leukemia Journal, and the Journal of Clinical Oncology. So with that said, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Kamrachi. Hello everyone, uh, I'm Rami Kumrukti from uh, Moffitt Cancer Center. I'm the section head for leukemia and MDS and uh, it's uh, truly an honor and great pleasure always to be speaking to our patients. Uh, I was asked to uh, provide a comprehensive overview over the clinical implications of genetic mutations in myodysplastic syndromes, which I think had become uh, a standard part of our routine care for our patients and implicated in helping us with the diagnosis, uh, the prognosis, and well as well tailoring the treatment accordingly. So I'll try to cover uh, this topic. Uh, and at the Q&A section, I'm very happy to answer uh, any questions. So as you all know, the myodysplastic syndrome are blood diseases. Uh, we do think of them as type of blood cancer. I know that cancer is a scary word, but the cancers are a spectrum and so is MDS. There are patients that will have survival exceeding 10 years and there are, there are patients, unfortunately, this is gonna be a life-threatening or serious disease. Uh, the disease is characterized by the factory uh, failure. So the bone marrow where the blood cells are produced is inefficient or unable to produce the blood counts. So we have resultant low blood counts, whether it's anemia, low platelets, or low neutrophils, and leads to complications. In certain circumstances, we have uh, you know, a defect in the assembly of the cells, and they get stuck in the early phase, which we call blast or leukemia cells. And if those are more than 20%, that's what people refer to as the acute myeloid leukemia, which is the more aggressive type of uh, blood cancer. MDS can be thought of as a pre-leukemia. Not every patient will progress to leukemia. It depends on the disease and its risk, but all over around one third of the patients, uh, roughly, unfortunately, at one point will progress to AML. Myodysplastic syndromes are not uncommon. Uh, they are probably one of the most common myeloid diseases that we encounter. Uh, the average age for patients is around 70. Uh, we really cannot pinpoint what caused the disease in most of the cases. Uh, in most of the cases, those are not inherited. It's nothing that the patient did wrong, unfortunately, to get them. There are random mistakes that happen in that factory, in those mother cells that produces the blood uh, that leads to uh, this disease. In some instances, we know that exposure to other chemotherapy for other types of cancers 
بنزين كيميكالز اكسبوجر اند ريرلي فاميليال تندنسي اور انهرتد ميوتيشنز كان بي سين ان ان سمول سبسيت اوف ام دي اس بيشنتس سو ناو ديز وي نو ذات ام دي اس از ريلي ا جينيتيك ديزيز سو the mistakes or the mishappening that lead the disease happen at the level of the uh, mother cell or the stem cell. We all have a factory that's producing the blood cells uh, where we have mother cells, we call them stem cells in our language. And in reality, those are billions and billions of cells that they divide and they go into lines of production. And when they, the cells are assembled, they get released out. We have one, one line called red blood cells. If they are low, we say you're anemic. Platelets, if they are low, we say uh, thrombocytopenia, and those are the soldiers to prevent the bleeding if we get in it. And the neutrophils or the white blood cells, which are family of cells, the, the most important we pay attention to are the neutrophils. Those are the soldiers that fight bacterial infection. So usually the process, those mother cells, billion of billion of them are dividing. They go into those lines of production like a car assembly line. And when things are ready, they get shipped out and do their function. So now we understand that the disease happens at those mother cell level where mishappenings happen in the you know, genetic material of those cells, either at the chromosome level or at the gene level. And those mistakes get carried and we develop a clone of cells that are abnormal that carry that mistake. And that clone first is ineffective producing blood. So that's why we get the anemia and the low blood counts. And second, sometimes cannot go through that line of production or maturation, so the cells can get stuck early on. And that's what we call uh, a blast. Uh, we should not have typically more than 5% blast. If they are increased, that's abnormal consistent with MDS. And as I mentioned, if they are more than 20%, that's the aggressive or what, what we call the leukemia, the acute, acute myeloid leukemia. Uh, now, those genetic events, and most of the time, uh, it's important to distinguish. Those are not inherited. So this is not a hereditary disease. Those are the mistakes that happened in those blood cells. So they are not present in the whole body. Rarely, rarely, as I mentioned, we have inherited types of MDS. But in 90% of the cases plus, those are random mistakes that happened in the mother cells of the blood cells, not the whole body, that leads to the disease. And they can happen at different levels in what I usually refer to, to when explaining to the patients as the control center of the cells, which are the chromosomes or the genes. And we know that those you know, mistakes can evolve and change over time. So if you see here, like, uh, for example, at time of diagnosis of MDS on this figure A, 26% uh, of the cells are normal, while majority of the cells are carrying some mistake. Uh, and that's the disease. And usually we, have, we may have more than one clone or abnormality or cells. And as the disease progresses, some of those cells will acquire more heads. Once we got one head, we are more liable to get subsequent heads. And that will lead to the progression of the disease. Uh, you know, what initiates those heads, we don't know exactly yet. Uh, there is a lot of uh, research ongoing about, you know, the interaction between the mutations or the mishappenings that occur on those stem cells and the environment in that bone marrow, the factory. Uh, so it seems that inflammation is important, whether the mutations happen first and set the bone marrow into inflammatory status or the other way that inflammation can also cause those cells to become unstable and get the mutations. It's not clear which starts, but definitely there is component of both. And once we have some mistakes that happened at the stem cell level, then we are more prone to have subsequent mistakes. So as I said, we can look at different levels. So when you are reading the reports from the doctors, you know, on the, on the uh, bone marrow test that's usually done to diagnose MDS, you wanna pay attention to something called karyotyping. Those are the cytogenetics as well. So here, you know, in the lab, they take, you know, the cells, in the dividing phase, and they look at the 23 pairs of chromosomes. So as you know from biology, we all have uh, you know, 23 pairs of chromosomes that carry all of our genetic material in each cell. So they will spread them as shown here under karyotyping and look at them under the uh, microscope and see those cells and see if there are parts are missing uh, and they will call the cytogenetics. In 30 to 40% of the MDS patients will see abnormalities here. Sometimes there is more sophisticated testing that they can look at 
copy number changes or smaller uh, uh, mistakes that happen. So we can look at different levels. So as, as I said, we can look at cytogenetics. Sometimes you will see in the report something called FISH, fluorescence and cytohybridization. Those are known or specific probes that the pathologist had made that they can go and look after certain abnormalities. So we know that certain abnormalities are common to happen in MDS, such as part of chromosome number five gets chipped out or part of chromosome seven gets chipped out. So we've developed certain probes that can go and look at that particular abnormality. So the cytogenetics that we check on the karyotype, as I showed you in a minute ago, um, are seen in 30 to 40%. The test has almost like one out of 20 sensitivity because we look at 20 cells usually. The fish is more sensitive, so it can you know, pick one out of 200 cells. So every now and then, but it's not common in five, less than 5% of the patients, the cytogenetics will be normal, but the fish testing will be a little bit more sensitive showing this abnormality. So those methods are trying to look at the chromosome level of the mishappenings. That's a whole part of a chromosome uh, or part of a chromosome that was chipped out, or sometimes we say a translocation happened when the chromosomes are dividing, two pieces join in an abnormal way that leads to abnormal protein and to the disease. The mistakes can happen at that level, at the chromosome level, but they can also happen at the gene level. Genes are the units in the chromosome that, you know, do the transcription and they are like almost the coding uh, language to develop the proteins that do the function in the cells. So the abnormalities can be either at the chromosome level or at the gene level. And nowadays we develop obviously more techniques to look at the gene level. So those are what we refer to as somatic gene mutations. And you know, a, a mutation means that there was a change in the sequence uh, of the coding part of the gene that leads to abnormal protein, that leads to abnormal function in the cell and obviously the disease. And in reality, this is a very complicated process and there could be obviously more than one mistake, more than one mutation. Uh, so the mutations also are different types. So not everything we see is really a pathogenic mutation. And that's very important to make sure that who's reading those reports is experienced with this. Because sometimes there is a change in the sequence or the code. So for example, you see here that, you know, maybe one change will not lead to abnormal protein. And that explains the differences between people. So this is like how the eye of the co uh, color colors of the eyes are different between people that there may be different in the protein there but when that change becomes abnormal that the coding or the protein that is produced from this different code is abnormal or dysfunctional or pathogenic that's what we call a real mutation so sometimes in the reports we would see abnormalities and would say, no, this is a variant. This is just a difference between people uh, and there are known variants. A, a mutation leads to abnormal protein. And the mutations are ty different types. They could be called uh, a missense, a nonsense, or a frame shift based on the result of that uh, uh, a point mutation or the abnormality that happened. So it turned out that those mutations are very common in MDS, commonly seen. And they can happen, and we can lump them into almost groups based on the part that's affected. Most of the mutations in MDS are in a machinery called epigenetic or splicing. Epigenetic regulation is the way we control the uh, transcription of the proteins. So usually the chromosomes are like a book. The book has to be open so that we can you know, do the coding and produce the proteins. The body can regulate the opening and the closing of the book in this epigenetic machinery. Uh, so if we add a methyl group to the chromosome, it closes the chromosome and we cannot do the transcription. The splicing is the processing after we produce the RNA, which is the second step before producing the protein. And that's kind of modification or cutting the, the protein to be functional. So it turns out that there are a lot of mistakes that happen in the genes that can control this. 
And obviously, I, I know the naming is, is hard or difficult, but uh, uh, those are the uh, mutations nomenclature. Uh, you would hear commonly about mutations like TET2, DNMT3A. Those are in the epigenetic machinery, SF3B1, SRSF2, and, and so forth. But those usually are lumped into families based on what those, what those genes typically do in the cell. In the past, it was obviously very challenging to sequence a gene. So we used to use a technique called Sanger sequencing, which is time consuming and, uh, and needs a lot of effort. Uh, so out of research, this was not readily available in practice. Now, what we do currently is testing or a platform called next generation sequencing, where we have much more sophisticated way of looking at the uh, genes. So when we take the bone marrow sample or in the blood, we extract the DNA, which carries the genetic material, and we amplify that. And then, you know, it's all computerized on a certain platform that could, you know, allow us, you know, in a, in a simultaneous way, sequencing, you know, hundreds of genes and identifying if there is abnormality. And that's t this test now had become readily available part of standard of care. Most of academic places, hospitals will offer it, but there are also, uh, you know, commercial labs that offer this testing uh, on a panel of genes that when in the research, we figured out that those are the most common uh, genes where a mutation can happen in MDS. So those panels vary from, you know, 24 genes, 54 genes, some labs offer up to 170 genes. In reality, you know, 90% plus of the abnormalities happen within 20 or 30 known genes, some of which I just showed you. Now, obviously at the beginning also, cost was prohibitive for, you know, doing this. And uh, the cost had substantially dropped down that probably nowadays even checking, you know, the next generation sequencing cost is below $2,000, uh, uh, which is probably equivalent to a check for a flu swap or something like that. So the cost had substantially come down as we you know, got better in the technology detecting those mutations. And again, the testing can be done on the blood or the bone marrow. Most of the time, the results are equivalent. So you don't have to have a repeat bone marrow to test for this. There are certain circumstances if the blood counts are very, very low, then it becomes more difficult to check this on the peripheral blood. So you know, how do you use this information nowadays? As I said, like in, in places specialized in management of MDS, this had become an integrated part of the management. Obviously, on the research side, it, it helps us a lot understanding the biology of the disease, what happens, how does the disease progress? But those are becoming reality and they are becoming part of the management for patients. So we use them to help us confirm the diagnosis or sometimes identify stages even before the MDS. We use them for the risk stratification or you know, what we refer to as the staging. And we use them as a tool to tailor the treatment accordingly. So this is again, just an example. This is 65 year old radiologist have you know, low blood counts over two years, uh, hemoglobin is 11, a normal for gentlemen is 13, uh, you know, and borderline low white blood cell count with the neutrophils being 1500, the typical is around 1800. And you know, the diagnostic test is done, uh, shows you know, some abnormality, uh, but this may not be enough for diagnostic. To diagnose MDS, we have to have low blood counts. And on the bone marrow, when they do it, either to have increased blasts or leukemia cells, or like see a lot of funny looking or abnormal cells. And that's what the name is really. Dysplasia means funny looking cells. Uh, so it really is a little bit subjective identifying those abnormal looking or dysplastic cells. And it requires a experienced hematopathologist to look under the microscope at those cells. So we do molecular profiling in this patient and we do see a, a mutation in a gene called ASXL1 mutation. And the question comes, is this diagnostic for MDS or not? Uh, and how do we use that in, in you know, complementing the 
blood tests, the bone marrow testing uh, in this setting. So this is what I just mentioned. To diagnose MDS, we have to have low blood counts below the normal. And we have to have either abnormal looking cells under the microscope, funny, increased leukemia cells, or in certain you know, conditions, if we have certain chromosome abnormalities, we can make the diagnosis of MDS. So if we did that genetic testing, certain abnormalities are diagnostic of MDS. It's always important to keep in mind that there are things that can mimic MDS or look like MDS. So the doctors always will look for vitamin B12 deficiency, folic acid, iron, uh, in certain circumstances, copper deficiency, sometimes medications or uh, autoimmune diseases can lead to funny looking cells. So it's important to do this workup to make sure there is nothing mimicking MDS. So as we you know, know now that this clonal hematopoiesis or the principle of a mistake happening in a subset of the cells is almost a normal process of aging. So as I discussed, there are those mother cells or we call them hematopoietic stem cells that are usually in the bone marrow, uh, the spongy space in our bones that are dividing and producing all our blood cells. And as I mentioned, those are billions and billions of cells dividing billion, a billion times a day. And you know when mistakes happen, those cells get copied that carry the mistake, and that's what we call a clone. So a group of cells will be carrying that mistake. And we learn now that that can happen without even the MDS. So it could be a step before, before the MDS, but it could be the first step. Not every patient that have a, a mutation will develop MDS. So we have this thing we call clonal hematopoiesis of indeterminate potential or clonal hematopoiesis of aging. So if we do this sophisticated testing of the next generation sequencing on 100 people walking in the street without any abnormal blood count, we will find based on the age that it happens probably you know, in 10% or more of anybody above age of 70 without having abnormality. So like when we are looking at the blood, if we are looking at 100 cells, we would see that there is 10 to 20% of them already are what we call clonal, that they already carry the mistake. And this is thought to be the first step of how we develop this. We call it CHIP, clonal hematopoiesis of indeterminate potential. So we always have some mistakes that the body refer, but then we get a mistake as shown here. Uh, that mistake is, is getting copied to other cells. And then subsequently another mis mistake happens and that's how we develop MDS. And the mistakes that we see are the same mutations that we also encounter in MDS. So you've already heard me talking those, you know, uh, naming those genes like DNMT3A, TET2, ASXL1, and so forth. So those are the same genes we see at this early stage. And there is no distinction between the mutations we see in MDS or in the pre-MDS setting. The importance of this chip, so again, this is somebody that doesn't have low blood counts, uh, have no medical problem, no, no hematological problems, blood disease problems. Uh, so those patients that already have that chip are at a higher risk of developing MDS. Uh, and it's almost at the rate of 0.5 to 1% per year. But and, and, you know, also what we learned that there's also some association between that and increased risk of heart attacks, heart failure, and other inflammatory conditions. It goes back to what I was trying to say at the beginning that there is interaction between this and the inflammatory milieu in the body. So uh, the highest risk actually for those patients was developing coronary artery disease and strokes more than even developing uh, blood diseases. So that's CHIP. So the CHIP is really the earliest stage. So there are no abnormal blood counts. Uh, those studies were actually done on patients that either had, you know, heart disease or volunteers. Uh, and nowadays, there is really no testing done on a large scale to look who does have CHIP or clonal hematopoiesis. The second step after that, if we start having the blood counts going down or low, but there is no abnormal looking cells on the uh, bone marrow when the pathologists look, they are not seeing that dysplasia, they cannot call it MDS. So nowadays we call it clonal cytopenia of unknown significance. So there is low blood counts and there is a mutation, but there is not enough on the bone marrow to call this MDS. Uh, 
And this CCUS is almost MDS. So it's the, uh, the, the stage just before the MDS probably. And when we look at those patients that have this CCUS or clonal cytopenia of unknown significance, that's the name, you know, over time, majority of those patients actually will have a frank MDS. And there had been recent studies looking at this showing that the outcome is similar to somebody which we label as a lower risk MDS. So basically at one point in the coming few years, the requirement to show funny looking cells under the microscope may go away and we may lump those along with MDS. So this is again different from the chip where there is no low blood counts. The, the first entity that I showed you that there is only one mutation that happened in small number of the cells. And so this is now the alphabet soup of this. So CHIP is the clonal hematopoiesis of indeterminate potential. This is just a mistake that happened in the gene so we can identify a somatic mutation. There are no abnormal funny looking cells, no low blood counts, no leukemia cells. And usually it's only 10 to 20% of the cells carrying this. The CCUS is basically, we are seeing mutations and low blood counts, but not funny looking cells under the microscope. And then if we start seeing the funny lo looking cells under the microscope or the blasts, we are calling this MDS. So the mutation testing is sensitive, but it's not specific. So you could, as I mentioned, you could see those abnormalities in you know, uh, normal or healthy people, uh, particularly above the age of 70. So that's why we don't, they are not considered part of the main diagnostic criteria, but they could help us. So the patient that the, the, I, I showed you, the, the, his presentation had low blood count, had a mutation, but the pathologist was not able to call it MDS. So now by the book, with the presence of that mutation, by the criteria we use, we will call that a clonal cytopenia of unknown significance. Uh, sometimes when we see several mutations, we say this is really looking like MDS and, and should be managed or uh, you know, treated as MDS. And sometimes they also help us to know the subtype of the MDS. So if we cert see certain mutations co-occurring together, like this step two mutation SRSF2, and the patient have a elevated subset of the white blood cell count called monocytes, uh, that makes us think so much of a subtype of the MDS called chronic myelomonocytic leukemia, or we abbreviate it and refer to it as CMML. And sometimes they can tease us, uh, they help us tease out uh, diseases that mimic MDS. So the, the blood diseases are families of diseases. There is the myelodysplastic syndrome we are discussing, but there are a group of diseases called myeloproliferative diseases. Myelo in Greek is always bone marrow, proliferative increased production. So there are certain mutations or abnormalities are more consistent with that. So not only it's telling us that there is something wrong went in the bone marrow, but sometimes it can help us a little bit to figure out in, in which, what, what is going wrong, because in selected cases or in rare cases, the distinction between those entities uh, is not that easy just looking uh, at the cells under the microscope. So the next you know, utility for those mutation testing nowadays is really the prognostic value or the staging. Uh, so when we stage or risk stratify uh, MDS, we are trying to get an idea about what is the risk of this going to acute myeloid leukemia, progressing to the aggressive leukemia. And, you know, and in a way, how life-threatening is this? And I think this is important because obviously each patient know, needs to know that. Uh, and obviously we tailor the treatment accordingly. We do have some effective treatments for MDS. We have some curative treatments for MDS, such as bone marrow transplant, but they have their risks and they are intense. So we weigh that based on the disease risk. And the staging in MDS is not like a lung cancer or colon cancer. So those cells are not going to spread around in the body. The staging most of the time clinically uh, is based on the blood counts, the degree of the blast or the percentage of the blast on the bone marrow and the makeup of those cells, the chromosome makeup that I referred to. And we lump those and we give a score. Your doctor will obviously usually refer to something called a revised IPSS, International Prognostic Scoring System, where we divide the stages out of five. We call them very low, low, intermediate, high, and very high risk. Or you can think of them as stage one to stage five. And the survival, 
the chance of leukemia transformation is dependent on those factors. However, we always see still sometimes that patients, we thought that they will not do well, and fortunately they do well, or the other way. So there is still a little bit heterogeneity in, in that clinical staging. So here is a, another case, 69-year-old lady uh, discovered to have low blood counts. Uh, the hemoglobin is 10. For ladies, you know, hemoglobin should be above 12. So this is anemia. The white blood count is a little bit on the lower side. The neutrophils, 1,220. Again, we said the normal is 1,800. And the platelets are 94. Uh, and typically, it's 140 and above. Uh, sometimes the low blood counts, when they are not profoundly low, that will not put the patient at risk, but they are clearly abnormal. So those counts you know, are probably adequate for daily living and will not endanger this patient, but obviously there is something wrong going on. So the patient gets a bone marrow. It does show those funny looking cells. The blast or the leukemia cells are not increased and the chromosome makeup, the cytogenetics that I told you about is looking normal, which as I mentioned, it's only 30 to 40% of the patients, uh, you know, we call that uh, we find an abnormality on that karyotyping where we are looking at all chromosomes. So the pathologist signs this as uh, mild plastic syndrome. Uh, we refer to it as uh, RCMD, uh, refractive cytopenia with multilineage dysplasia because they are seeing funny cells uh, in more than one cell line. Uh, and the question is, what's the risk? When we apply this revised IPSS scoring, the patient doesn't have really major risk factors, you know, maybe for the, you know, platelets and for the percentage of the blasts. So the risk score is called the low and that's like almost the stage two. We do the molecular profiling and this patient is found to have a mutation in a gene called EZH2. So how does that impact the, 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 the prognosis and the staging for the patient? So there have been several studies looking at this and identifying that presence of certain gene mutations would actually upstage or increase the risk. And here is shown some of those mutations, uh, the names of them. Uh, this was a, one of the first papers that came out and established that by Dr. Behart was published in the New England Journal paper, uh, 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 journal. So if a patient, for example, is a low risk and they have this mutation, they almost will be behaving like an intermediate risk group in their outcome. And this is in the context of the new or modern risk model that we use, the revised IPSS. So our patient had this, that I just presented, had this EZH mutation. We were calling the patient low risk, but with that mutation, and this is just showing the outcome or the, you know, what we call a median survival of around you know, two years. So this is gonna affect the patient outcome probably, changing it from somebody that we expected are, are gonna do well for five years to unfortunately somebody that their disease could be life-threatening in shorter time. And that will make us start thinking, should we act based on that earlier? Uh, and what should we do? So, and this had been looked again in, in, by, by several groups that did research on this. Uh, and the bottom line, you know, uh, there are certain mutations that are known to be associated with worse outcome. There are some mutations actually are associated with good outcome and even more favorable prognosis rather than not having them, namely this mutation called SF3B1, and that's in the splicing machinery. Commonly with that, when we look under the microscope, we'll see cells look like what we name, call them ring sidroblasts. There is iron deposit around them. So we have a type of MDS called MDS with ring sidroblast. And 80% of those patients will have this SF3B1 mutation. And that probably is one of the best subtypes, if one can say there is a best subtype of MDS, where the patient's survival is expected to be above 10 years, very, very low chance of going to leukemia. And nowadays there are medications approved by the FDA for this type. A mutation on a, in a gene called P53 is unfortunately always, regardless of what's happening, is associated with worse outcomes. So this is one of the mutations that we really don't like to see uh, in any uh, subtype of MDS. So P53 typically is associated with worse outcome. SF3B1 is associated with good outcome. So this P53 mutation, this is like a, the P53 is a protein that acts almost like a break uh, 
on the cells. So it's keeping things under control. When we say it's mutated, it means that the brakes are off and there is no control. And that means the cells are unregulated. Uh, so when we see it, we don't like that. That's not good. Typically associated with, unfortunately, very high rate of transformation to leukemia and a life-threatening disease. But it's not just is the mutation there or not. Sometimes we look at the magnitude of the, or the number of the cells that carry the mistake. We refer to it as the clonal burden or the variant allele frequency. So it turned out if the variant allele frequency is more than 40% of the cells or 40%, then those patients really unfortunately have much worse outcome. While if the mutation is seen in a smaller number of the cells, the outcome could be a little bit better uh, than you know, uh, having it in, in many cells. And we, we see a lot you know, pati uh, of patients that have what we call a complex karyotype. So when looking at the chromosomes, we are seeing that there are four, five, six abnormalities. Part of chromosome seven was chipped, part of chromosome five, chromosome 17 is missing completely. That's usually not a good thing. But it turned out that if there is no P53 mutation, e even the presence of multiple abnormalities at the chromosome level, but there is no gene mutation at the gene level of the P53, that those patients actually do better than having the P53. So it's the, the P53 is really the driver of the aggressive disease. And whether, as you know, each gene in our body have two alleles, two copies, and if it's one copy affected, that's probably better than having two copies affected. And also the number of mutations matter. So obviously if we see four or five mutations, that's not as good as seeing one or two mutations. So, so as I showed you so far, like they can help us with the diagnosis. They can help us identify patients at risk of developing MDS later on. Um, we use them now to uh, risk stratify or stage the patients. There are certain mutations when we see that's gonna change the clinical uh, prognosis or the staging. And finally, we are more and more implementing those into tailoring the treatment accordingly. So this is a, another example. This is 80 year old uh, lady that uh, came to see us because of a new MDS diagnosis. We did a bone marrow 18% myeloblast. So those leukemia cells are increased. The patient was really reluctant to pursue cert, uh, therapy uh, as you know, the local oncologist discussed intensive chemotherapy, which typically we don't uh, uh, offer because the benefit is limited for patients above age of 80, except selected cases, uh, hydria, hypomethylating agents, azonucleosides, or referral for clinical trial. The patient had a gene mutation showing that she had TET2 mutation. So when we saw this patient, we said like, you know, based on the disease, normal chromosomes, and really, uh, you know, absence of other bad players other than that the leukemia cells are increased, you probably have a good chance of responding to this medication is a, a, a cytidine uh, that can be done as an outpatient, relatively very well tolerated, does not worsen quality of life, and probably can benefit from it going even into remission, prolonging the survival and having a good quality of life. It's not a cure for the disease, but will prolong the survival with adding quality of life. And the patient agreed to get treatment and did, in, in, in fact, respond to that. So what we know, particularly for those hypomethylating agents, uh, there are two drugs approved, azacitidine, decitabine, very similar drugs. And this year we got a third one uh, called Encovi. That's an oral form of the decitabine. So those three drugs are like backbone for treating a lot of the MDS patients, especially the higher risk. So we know if somebody have a TET2 mutation, that's the name of the gene. And the other gene, the SXL1, is not mutated, which we refer to as a wild type, a normal type. Those patients have higher or four, uh, falls, you know, better chance of responding to the treatment. So they are more likely to respond to the treatment. So that will make it more appealing to try this medication, again, in the higher risk setting. Uh, now, what if we have the mutation, we don't use those drugs? Not necessarily because unfortunately, sometimes we don't have other options. So even for a less chance of response, you know, if we need treatment, we'll still use them. And we see that obviously those patients that have this profile, they will have 
actually maybe better survival when treated and be on this treatment for longer time. So this is some, one way we look at it. The other way we look at it in, in terms of in, you know, uh, integrating the mutational status of the genes in the treatment or tailoring the treatment accordingly is the transplant. So nowadays we know that if patients have certain abnormalities going to transplant, they will really have very high risk of the disease coming back. So this P53, the bad, uh, ugly mutation that I was referring to, if it's detectable at time of transplant, unfortunately was associated with very bad outcome, very high chance of relapse. But sometimes I discuss with my patients that we really should try to do something to see if we can get that under control before the transplant because obviously the transplant is intense and I don't want to put a patient through a transplant realizing that the chances of recurrence of the disease are very high. So what we do at least in our place, sometimes we try those hypomethylating agents or we have access to clinical trials where we try to clear or decrease the burden of that P53 mutation going to transplant, hoping for better outcome or cure. So we still can cure some patients even with the presence of the P53 mutation with transplant, uh, but that's probably one out of five patients or, or, or you know, less. While if we were able to cure the, or to clear the P53, it seems at least from this small study that we did here that the outcome was better. And there are several promising agents that are in clinical trials, particularly also trying to overcome some of those bad mutations. Uh, those are all drugs that are in advanced phase. Venetoclax is a drug approved for acute myeloid leukemia. We are testing in, in, in MDS. Certain mutations like IDH1, IDH2 seems to be very sensitive to this. Venetoclax unfortunately doesn't look to work very well in the P53. Magrilumab is an antibody that we are using. It seems to be what, you know, agonistic of the mutation. So the patients are having good outcome regardless. And the first look that even patients with P53 mutation had a good response to this. Another drug called Pavindostat also seems to be improving the outcome uh, for patients leading to durable responses. Uh, a drug called APR246 is looking at P53 mutation, particularly trying to restore those breaks that I discussed. Sabatumab, a drug that brings the immune system and target the leukemia cells. So many of those drugs are in advanced phase actually testing where we are trying to look uh, at those hopefully improving the outcome in, in MDS patients, but also trying to look at, you know, patients in terms of the genetic mutation signature or the profile and there could be that there are patients that like have the IDH1, IDH2 mutation have the, will have the best outcome adding venetoclax to the current standard, the ASA, while there are patients that will benefit more adding the megrilumab and so forth. So this is really an evolving field and the identifying of the mutations is key to know which are the patients that will benefit most from those you know, ongoing treatments. And obviously we use some of these mutations now in practice or the, the profiling. So if patients have a deletion 5Q on cytogenetic abnormalities and they are lower risk MDS. So here our goal is treating their you know, low blood counts. The risk of leukemia is not high. It's not like the other patients I was alluding to that we have to do high, you know, azacitidine and think of transplant. And in patients who are lower risk MDS, we go stepwise. But if somebody have part of chromosome five chip, there is a drug called lenalidomide approved by the FDA that have almost 70% chance of making the patients not needing blood transfusions and improving the outcome. If patients have those ring sidroblast or that SF3B1 mutation I mentioned too, this year finally we got a new drug approved by, for MDS called Luspatercept. This is an injection every three weeks that you know, render patients transfusion independent. Uh, particularly working well in that subset of patients that have this SF3B1 mutation or ring sidroblast. In younger patients, sometimes we think of you know, using treatment called immunosuppressive therapy, but it really doesn't work well if you have those ring sidroblasts or the SF3B1. So even in practice now, we kind of complement the clinical you know, features, whether the disease is higher risk or lower risk, the goal of treatment. We also look at the mutations and you know, can say or predict a little bit you know, which next treatment to pick or tailor the treatment accordingly, as I mentioned. And sometimes nowadays, 
we may go you know out of the box a little bit uh, those are drugs approved by the fda for leukemias but may not be approved for particularly mds but after using hypomethylating agents when they stop working particularly for the higher risk mds if there is no transplant then we really don't have anything approved by the fda sometimes we think of intensive chemotherapy that can work in subset of patients but doesn't work in patients that have for example the p53 mutation uh so we do the gene testing again and you know there are drugs that there are genes that we call them targetable we can go after them with certain drugs available and approved by the FDA and obviously backed up by some data that shows responses in patients after HMA failure so that's another role so we talked about the diagnosis the risk certification maybe telling the treatment and sometimes we use them in in cases we are, where we run out of the standard options maybe we'll find something that is targetable we go after and achieve a response again for the patients the other thing also we are trying to look at this now is doing those testing serial so if somebody has the mutation and it goes away what's the value of that there is a lot of evolving you know research in an area called minimal residual disease So even in those patients that achieve a remission when we look at the bone marrow there are no leukemia cells and the counts are improving sometimes when we do more sophisticated techniques we still see a lot of the disease thinking of it almost as the tip of the iceberg and there is a lot of the disease under underlying there uh, and as we get more sophisticated we have methods now to look at this what we call minimal residual disease and the deeper the response we achieve if we don't have minimal residual disease the outcome is going to be better Uh, in the past in MDS we didn't have many active treatments that can achieve that but hopefully now as this is evolving and this is becoming established in leukemias that may be serial monitoring and if patients get into MRD negativity or like which means that we don't see the disease at the deeper level those patients will have better outcome and maybe even in the future we are going to tailor the treatment the need for transplant or not based on that So I think in conclusion you know it's important to identify gene mutations and the common you know technology used now is referred to as next generation sequencing it definitely contributed to better understanding of the disease biology and disease evolution the gene mutations are sensitive but they are not specific for MDS so we have to put them in the right context uh, confirming the diagnosis of MDS or you know suggesting a stage before the MDS as i showed you certain gene mutations have an established prognostic role uh, independent from the clinical variables that we see and the role of genetic mutations to tailor and monitor treatment continue to evolve uh, it's exciting time for somebody that does research in mds like me that nowadays we are able to offer patients much more options than we were able 5 years ago and my hope is as we continue this uh, we even accelerate this to be able to get newer options improve outcomes for our patients in the soon future uh, in the clinic uh, thank you for listening this is my email if you have any questions i'll be very happy to answer thank you dr kamrachi your presentation was wonderful and thank you all for joining us today for those of you who haven't sent in your questions you can start submitting your questions in the question box found on the bottom menu bar And for those who want to revisit this recorded webinar, a viewing link will be sent to all registrants and will be available on the MDS Foundation website for on-demand viewing within 10 business days. All right, let's proceed to the live Q&A. Our first question comes from Susan, diagnosed in 2016 with MDS RAEB, refractory anemia with excess blasts with IDH2. and DNNT3 mutations. In 2017, she had a stem cell transplant with her brother being a related 10 out of 10 match. Post transplant, she still has the DNNT3 mutation not transmitted from her sibling match. She wants to know why she still has this mutation and what does this mean in terms of her maintaining her current wellness? Thank you yeah uh thank you Susan for the question that's an important question and uh, again just to reiterate I'm very happy to be here and uh, wish we were in be in person so first thing is really to make sure that what is called a mutation is real mutation because it's not uncommon to see the NMT3A as just a variation uh 
as I was trying to say in the talk, it could be just the difference in eye colors between people. So we look at, you know, in the report, sometimes they will tell you, is it in the functional area or not? What's the allele burden or the size of the clone, if it's around the 50-ish percent? And uh, then as you alluded, then it could be transmitted. There is donor-related chip or variation that your brother was different in one amino acid that's even not pathological. And they are seeing that and now calling it. Um, now, it could be also part of persistence of the disease. Uh, uh, usually, you know, not every patient after transplant will become what we call MRD negative. Uh, there is no established role to do treatment based that. So obviously it could be, as I mentioned, from the brother still, they have to look into that. It could be just a variation or it could be uh, like persistent disease. If it's a persistent disease, when the counts are, reason are, are normal and the bone marrow is not showing relapse after transplant and things are okay, I don't think we have, you know, evidence that we should do anything to have that mutation disappear. So, you know, from observation wise, I will just observe it. Thank you, Dr. Kamrachi. Our next question is from an MDS patient who has now transformed to acute myeloid leukemia. He's 67 years old and also has hypertension and hyperglycemia. He wants to know what is the best treatment option for him? Yeah, so this is obviously complicated. There is no one best treatment for somebody that transformed to AML. Uh, obviously, I, I know some features there. There is the age. Uh, so uh, he's above age of 60, have some comorbidities, but those would not exclude treatment. Uh, when MDS goes to AML, we look at the first thing about the patient, you know, Two, two things, patient-related factors and disease-related factors. And our first step is to decide, are we going to do intensive chemotherapy versus less intensive chemotherapy? And it also depends what treatment the patient got for this MDS. This patient, was he on hypermethylating agents and now progressed to AML, or he was just on observation or got Procrit and now transformed to AML. But in general, in AML, deciding on treatment, we look if the patient have, you know, what are the disease-related factor and the host-related factor or the patient-related factor. So if patients were functional in good shape, then they are eligible for intensive chemotherapy. We look at the disease. There are certain subtypes of the disease that actually will do better with the less intense chemotherapy. So there are different options. So there is the option of, you know, hypomethylating agents. Now we combine a treatment with them called uh, venetoclax a pill. There is the option of intensive chemotherapy. There is a drug called Vixius, which is approved by the FDA for AML coming from MDS. Uh, sometimes some patients will just be treated with hypomethylating agents like what we do in uh, MDS. In all the patients, we always are thinking of the transplant also in, in patients that transform to ML because the only curative strategy is really the transplant. Uh, there are certain patients also may have like this IDH1, IDH2 mutations. There are drugs that can target that. So again, there are different options. There is not one answer that fits all patients that transform from MDS to ML. Thank you. Our next question is from Debbie. She wants to know if the mutation panel done from the bone marrow differs from the one done from the peripheral blood. If so, how? Right. So that's a good question. So uh, they've looked at this and, and there is actually a really relatively very good concordance. So like, you know, obviously all the blood cells seen in the peripheral blood are coming from the bone marrow. So the concordance is high. Uh, and even the, the size of the clone in terms of the size of the clone is, is very good concordance. It's almost like 90% plus. The only exception would be sometimes when patients' blood counts are very low, uh, like they have no neutrophils, the soldiers that fight the infection, then the bone marrow becomes a little bit better. Uh, but other than that, in general, it's equivalent, and we actually do them most of the time on the peripheral blood. Thank you. The next question comes from a 76-year-old woman diagnosed in 2019 with no real symptoms. Um, she was diagnosed with MDS with multilineage dysplasia with ringed sideroblasts at 15.5%. She has an isolated trisomy 19. Um, her blood counts are still stable. However, her platelet count changed now around 75 to 79. 
She has the isolated trisomy 19 and a pathologic mutation in SRSF2. She had radiation for breast cancer in 2014. She wants to know if you have any advice going forward. Yeah, so th this is a little bit mixed. So obviously, like the question is this therapy related in the context of prior breast cancer in 2014, it seems only radiation was done. What we know, even if this is was from the radiation for the breast cancer, that radiation induced MDS tend to do as probably good as the primary MDS, not, not coming from like chemotherapy related MDS. Uh, the fact that this is, uh, you know, MDS with ring sidroblast subtype, that subtype is usually is good. Uh, uh, the trisomy 19 is kind of intermediate. It's not good, it's not bad. And then the SRSF2 usually is not commonly seen with the ring sideroblast. Usually we see the SF3B1. And again, the SF, SRSF2, it's controversial. Some say it's good, some say it's bad. I would say all over the platelets are adequate for daily living. With the platelets in their 70s, there is no indication to treat immediately. And I don't think we have evidence if we start treatment early, we'll change natural history now. I would wait, I would observe the counts closely. Sometimes things could stay stable like this for years. If the count starts dropping, then I think also it depends on what is dropping. Uh, sometimes it's just the anemia procrit injections. The simple one could be fine. There is a new drug approved by the FDA for patients with ring sideroblast, Luspatercept. She will be a good candidate for that because sometimes that improves the red blood cells and the platelets. Um, I would usually save the uh, Vidaza or Dacogen or what we call the hypomethylating agents for a later step or if I see that the disease risk is changing. Thank you, great answer. The next question comes from Bonnie. She has four mutations, the DNMT3A, the SF3B1, TET2, and CUX1. She can't find much information on the CUX1. Is that associated with the 7Q deletion? Yes, so the COX-1 is reported in MDS and it is associated with 7Q. Obviously, it's not a common one. So in general, uh, like the prognosis and everything is not established because obviously to look at the outcome, you have to have large number of patients where we tested that. Some studies said it is associated with poor prognosis, but it's obviously in the chromosome 7 area, which is known to be associated with poor prognosis. So. I would say it's in, in, in majority, like we really don't know because we don't have large number on the COX-1, but some studies did suggest that it's associated with worse outcome. Uh, the, the thing I notice in my practice with the COX-1, many times what they are calling a mutation is not really a mutation. So I would say the first step is really make sure that it's a real mutation before we even worry about it. Thank you. The next question comes from Donna. She wants to know, does your risk factor change as you improve the treatment or is it based on what they find prior to treatment? She was diagnosed with intermediate risk MDS, had dacogen treatment. Currently her RBCs, her blood cell, red blood cell counts and platelets are just a little low. Her WBC ANC is very low. She wants to know, is she now low risk? Right, so that's also a very good question. And it's like, it's very controversial. It depends how you look at it. So obviously, uh, you know, the, the staging models that were done for MDS were done at time of diagnosis and they were never been implicated to be used at different times. So almost like you restage after a while. So we don't know that. And typically they predict the outcome when they're applied at time of diagnosis, uh, almost regardless of the treatments in a way. But on the other hand, I would say a response to treatment probably does alter the natural history. Obviously, somebody that have a response to treatment will do better. We know from studies with the Vidaza and Dacogen, if patients that go into complete remission, or even if their just blood counts improve, then they will drive survival advantage uh, from the treatment, uh, regardless of you know uh, anything else, uh, compared to patients that their disease is not responding to dacogen. So I would say it's always a good thing to respond to treatment that probably resets the clock, but we don't know about the restaging at different time points. Thank you. The next question is, does your risk factor change based on the number of mutations you have? Are there specific mutations that almost always lead to AML? And what is the significance of the RUNX1 mutation? 
Right. So again, very, very good question. So the number of mutations matter per se, regardless of the mutation. So if somebody that have five or six real mutations are going to do worse, like, you know, you know, I, I think the cutoff where you really start seeing the difference is like once you have like four or more mutations, like there are sometimes concomitant mutations together. Like if you have the SF3B1, which is a good presence of other mutation with it, you know, in general will not make it worse, but the number matters. Uh, specific mutations associated with transformation to AML. Obviously, as we talked about, the P53 is really the evil mutation. Like that's the mutation we hate most to see. Uh, it is associated with higher AML. Now, RANX1 is associated with higher rate of transformation to AML. Uh, uh, you know, I don't know if it's inevitable, but definitely higher rates uh, in AML now by the criteria, they do consider RANX1 as a higher risk. But again, the RANX1 is also another mutation that we commonly see and reported as a mutation. And it's really not a mutation. If the size of the clone is 50% and the report saying this is not, this not, not, you know, affecting the functionality of the gene and it's reported as a variant in population it could be just a variation but a real run x1 is associated with worse outcome thank you the next question comes from bernard he wants to know when would you be treated with something like epigen or retrocrit growth factors and when would you move to um, possibly a hypomethylating agent like azacitidine or dacogen or other drugs Right. So again, you know, the, the answer for this is very variable. It depends first on the disease risk. If somebody is a higher risk disease MDS, then we are thinking transplant, we are starting ASA or dacogen, particularly if the blood counts are low. If somebody is lower risk MDS, then we have time and we go stepwise and we ask what's the most abnormality. Most of the time we are treating for anemia and preventing patients becoming transfusion dependent, needing blood on a regular basis. So then we go with Procrit, erythropoietin, it's a very reasonable step. Uh, and I usually preserve the use of azacitidine in the lower risk patients as my last step, or if I'm seeing bad features of there is really low other blood counts like the platelet and neutrophil that dictates the use of it. I don't jump on using them. Each treatment we use for MDS has a short, certain chance of working, 30, 40%, some of them could be 50%, it depends. And they have a certain duration they work, then they stop working. All of them are good treatments, they work in subset of patients then stop working. So sometimes it's also reasonable to think of maximizing the benefit or getting the mileage out of every treatment using it at the appropriate time. Thank you. The next question comes from Michael. Is there a particular gene panel that he should do for low risk MDS versus high risk MDS? so that he will have more information in order to guide therapy? Most of the gene panels will cover all the mutations that are there. So if you are getting any of the commercially available NGS panels now, most of them have 24 genes, which will cover both. Uh, like in a way that the impact of the mutation could vary a little bit between a lower risk or a higher risk. Like what we consider a bad mutation in lower risk could be a little bit different from higher risk. But in general, any panel you are going to get today will cover all the mutations that will happen in MDS and AML, actually. So, Thank you. The next question comes from Christy. Her dad has a complex karyotype, the RUNX1, GATA2, and SEBPA. She wants to know if this is common. Um, and she also wants to know if there is a familial link with all, all of these mutations. He went 18 months before transforming to AML. Right. So th those mutations are seen like the RUNX1 and the uh, GATA2 are commonly seen in MDS. The CEPPPA could be seen. CEPPPA alpha, if it is double mutations, they are good risk in AML. Uh, so, so they are commonly known mutations in MDS and AML. I think to answer the question of the family history, now most of the time in 90% plus, those mutations are mishappenings that happen in the blood cells. They are not inherited from parents. You don't, you know, pass to your kids. There are rare circumstances where there could be inherited, but there will be strong family history. Now, RANX1, there is familial thrombocytopenia syndrome, where patients will have low platelets for many years, and there will be several members in the family that have low platelets. Uh, 
And you know that's associated with what we call a germline RANX1 mutation. That's something we were born with. Mutations are either called germline, which means we were born with them, or like somatic that happened just in the tissue where the blood disease or the cancer happened. So there is familial RANX1, but again, there will be strong family history. There is familial GATA2 as well, you know, so there are a few of them. So those couple could be if there is a strong family history, but usually there will be strong family history or other clue that this is inherited. But the general rule that in 90% MDS is not inherited disease. Thank you. The next question is from a patient who has MDS with multilineage dysplasia, mutations in ASXL1, TET2, REX1, and SRF. S2. Dacogen helped, helped uh, greatly with their platelets, but they had to stop because their numbers weren't coming up. The plan was changed to five days every three months. Should you treat just to slow down progression of the disease when you have these mutations, or should you just treat when numbers are poor? Yeah, that's a very good question. So I would say you probably treat based on the uh, numbers because hypomethylating agent treatment have not been shown in many cases to uh, make those mutations go away. The only mutation we see going away and, and with dacogen or videza sometimes is the P53, which is the bad one. So it goes down, but it comes back and relapses. The other mutations, we see them persisting. So what the videza or dacogen is doing is just making those cells more efficient to produce blood. We call it differentiating effect. Uh, so having said that, obviously, in this case, it depends on the patient age, uh, you know, with those mutations, they may upstage the disease risk. So if this is somebody with low blood counts and, you know, eligible for transplant, they should be looked for transplant. But again, I, I know it, it, there are many variables there. I would say dacogen every three months is not a treatment, you know, like I, I, it's kind of unheard of because, uh, you know, most of the time, we spread those to five or six weeks based on count of recovery. But if the counts are not recovering in three weeks, that's disease, not dacogen. And once you spread dacogen more than six weeks, you lose the response and you don't get it back. So I'm not sure really what's the benefit at this point, continuing the dacogen every three months. Uh, but to answer your question, we treat based on counts not to make those mutations go away. If one of those mutations go away, the only way we think of it is transplant. Great answer, Dr. Kamrachi. The next question comes from Ina regarding transfusion dependency and accumulation of iron overload. At what level of ferritin do you recommend iron chelation and what are the side effects of iron chelation? Right, so that's also like, that's a controversial issue a little bit in MDS and you know, there are schools or camps, there are believers in iron chelation and there are non-believers. I would say my take on it is obviously over time, once patients get to 15 to 20 units of blood, they do have evidence of iron overload and we have no active mechanism to get rid of it. So we should think of it and consider it. Uh, there are differences in the guidelines. The MDS foundation guidelines, I think, uh, says if the ferritin is more than 1,000, the NCCN says above 2,500. So somewhere in between maybe is the truth. Uh, so once I see that the patients had blood transfusions more than 15 to 20 units, because some patients will have ferritin high, just part of the MDS disease because the ferritin is an inflammatory marker. So you have to have had you know, significant amount of transfusions and the ferritin is high and the patient's disease is lower risk. Uh, then I think it's reasonable to think about it and consider it. There are data retrospective and some ob you know, observational and prospective indirectly showing that there are, there are advantages obviously of the iron chelation. Uh, so I will offer it to patients. The downside could be some adverse events, mainly like, you know, GI, like diarrhea, uh, stomach upset, and uh, affecting the kidney functions. So in many cases, we keep eye on kidney functions uh, with that. Uh, so in patients that fit that, that they have heavy transfusion, you know, re record, their ferritin is persistently elevated. And it's very important to check it in the outpatient setting where there is no infection. And if it's persistently elevated to have that discussion. Thank you. The next question is from Gwen. Do you think that CRISPR will ever be able to repair the myriad of mutations found in MDS? Yeah, it's, it's too early now. I think that's almost like, you know, 
maybe science fiction at this point in MDS, but obviously they are doing it in other diseases. Uh, uh, I, I think it's been helpful in, in uh, MDS to create models to study the disease, uh, probably one day, but I don't think in the near future, to my knowledge, but I'm not expert on CRISPR technology. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the next question is from a patient being treated with decidabine and venetoclax. He's had two cycles, um, but still experienced cytopenia, and he wants to know what's next. What can he expect next? Yeah, so again, you know, you, you'd like to have more details when answering questions like that. So is it for AML or MDS? In MDS, the use of venetoclax is not by label. So uh, it's not approved by the FDA. Do we use it in certain circumstances? Yes, we do. Uh, the combination of the cytopenia venetoclax in AML has improved the outcome, the survival, but there is a lot of details on how to use it. So hopefully the, the, you know, this is done under supervision of a center familiar with MDS or AML, because when you do dacogen venetoclax, you need to repeat a bone marrow at the first month after the first cycle and assess the response. And sometimes after the third, second cycle, in many cases, this combination is very myelosuppressive, lowers the blood count. So if we repeated the bone marrow and the patient is responding, which means the blasts are gone, but the bone marrow is looking empty, no cells, we back off both the dacogen and venetoclax. We hold them for a few weeks till the counts come up, up and then we dial back the venetoclax to only a week or two weeks and cut down the dosing. This is very, very important what I'm saying, because unfortunately we are seeing patients refer to us with very bad mold infections. And sometimes, unfortunately, this could be life threatening. Uh, so if you had two cycles, your blood counts are low. The first question is, is it working or not? If there is persistent disease, then that treatment probably is not working. If the blast are gone and the bone marrow is looking empty, you need a break of those two and then come back, adjust the dosing. Thank you. Marietta wants to know, what would be the prognosis for someone who has both the SF3, B1, and P53 G mutations? She failed by days of treatment. Um, she's currently on Lispatercept and seems to be responding so far. Right, so that's a very good question. So, you know, what was published by the International Working Group uh, on SF3B1, they really didn't have enough number of patients that had SF3B1 and P53 mutation together. So again, that's not a common scenario. Uh, and again, like it depends on what's calling P53. Again, please make sure every time, you know, that what they, what they called you, told you you have a mutation is a real mutation because even the P53, there are mutations that are just variants that are between different ethnicities and you know race and all, all that. In in our in our experience, and I've uh, I, I maintain a database for MDS, and I've looked specifically in the SF3B1 patients. Uh, we've only had like 15 patients out of 400 that had SF3B1 in our institution that had SF3B1 and P53. So the numbers are small. There was no difference in the outcome in terms of survival. There was a little bit higher transformation to AML, but I would say this is a very rare occurrence that we really don't know. Uh, uh, if you are responding to the Spattercept, I'll drive the mileage out of it for now. Thank you. The next question is, should I try hypomethylating drugs before being transplanted? Yeah, so again, that depends on the context. So if somebody is a higher risk MDS patient, the first question we ask, should we go to transplant? And that again is dependent on patient related factors, you know, that they are functional up and about, no major other medical problems. Age per se, at least up to age of 75 or nowadays up to 77, age is not the determinant. It's the, what determinant is the, the function of the patient and the other medical problems. Then the disease itself. If somebody is a higher risk, then we are thinking of transplant. If somebody is going to transplant, then there is controversy about should you do hypomethylating agents before transplant or not. I believe you should in general because usually you improve things. If the leukemia cells are up, you bring them down to maximize your chances for transplant. And it's also definitive treatment. In patients that are not eligible to transplant, then hypomethylating agents are the best option. Till now, we still say in a higher risk MDS patients, the best timing to go to transplant 
is upfront and not delay it. So uh, even if hypomethylating agents are started, you should go to transplant because once we lose the response to hypomethylating agents, we don't know what will happen. Down the road, as hopefully we get many of those combinations that are very effective, we may change that. But for now, if you are going to go to transplant, we start hypomethylating agents just as a bridge to get to transplant. If not going to transplant, we do hypomethylating agents indefinitely till they stop working. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from James. He wants to know how effective is Inquovi for the treatment of MDS patients and what are other options for treatment for him? Yeah, so Encovi is the most one of the new approved drugs. It is basically dicogen or decytabine in oral formulation. And the approval is for the intermediate and higher risk. It's 100% bioequivalent. So it's just a oral form of taking the dicogen that we've used uh, uh, for many years. So um, they are interchangeable. What I'm finding, obviously, uh, you know, sometimes the copay on oral medication is higher. So that's been, you know, precluding some patients using it. It's a pill you take at home either three days or five days out of the month, similar to the dicogen, but obviously needs a lot of monitoring. What options are available there, it's really dependent on the disease. It will take me maybe two hours to go through covering the options. Uh, they range, as I mentioned, from erythroid stimulating agents, Revlimid, Dacogen, Videsa, Luspatercept, chemotherapy, transplant. And it's really tailored to the patient risk, goals, comorbidities, all that stuff. Thank you. Uh, Larry wants to know, are germline and somatic mutations mutually exclusive or do they overlap, in particular with RUNX1? Yeah, that's a good question. Like, I, I, you know, like you could technically have somatic mutation and a germline mutation. Uh, most of the time, if we saw those familial thrombocytopenia, we just see the germline mutation. Thank you. The next question is, are there drawbacks or serious side effects to taking the drug Lospatercept? Yeah, so we developed, we actually like developed the Lospatercept. I was the national PI in the US on the study and the, the drug is approved for patients with ring sideroblast, low risk, transfusion dependent. Uh, the benefit obviously is many patients will get off transfusions, it improves their hemoglobin. Most of the side effects that we've seen and with a follow-up that's basically a while now are, are, are short-term. There had been no signal of increased risk of leukemia or disease progression. On the short term, patients may experience fatigue that's disproportionate to the blood counts, aches, some GI, uh, like, you know, diarrhea, uh, um, the loose bowel movements, uh, you know, nausea, uh, ankle swelling. Uh, most of those side effects go away over time. They are all reversible. Uh, usually the fatigue will disappear after two to four months. Uh, so in, in my experience, we've had only few patients that had to come off because of the magnitude of those side effects, which again, most of them are, or all of them are on the short term and, and reversible to my knowledge. There had been no reports to my knowledge affecting long term. For patients that are hypertensive, we do check the blood pressure before giving the Lospatercept. And obviously, if patient's blood, uh, blood pressure is not controlled, we maximize their, medic their hypertension treatment. Thank you. The next question comes from Liz. She's 56 years old. She has the SF4B1 mutation with refractory anemia and multilineage dysplasia. Her hemoglobin is at 10. She has no treatment at the current time, but she's very fatigued and it's affecting her quality of life. When would you recommend her beginning Lispatercept and would it help? Right. So first, like, you know, most of the studies, like really the, the fatigue seems a little bit disproportionate to the counts because when hemoglobin is 10, most people will not feel it. And especially it sounds like a young patient, like, you know, most people will feel the anemia when it's below nine or eight, but it's obviously hard to tell. It depends on the context of other things. Uh, like if there is heart disease, lung disease, uh, the patient performance, all that stuff. But in, and most of the studies have shown like, you know, Pushing more than 10 at maybe to 11, the, the, the impact of the, and the quality of life is going to be 
dismal. So I don't know if a treatment is warranted now. You could talk to your doctor and try a one-time blood transfusion or do some procrit and see if the counts improve and do you feel better, kind of a trial and error because every patient is individualized. Uh, Luspater cert is approved a second line. So for the first line, it's going to be procrit which is erythropoietin, a hormone that the kidney produces. And in patients with lymph sideroblasts can work very well and can work for many years. There is no need to jump on the lispatercept. Lispatercept is promising in this area. There is a study that's ongoing that is looking at randomizing patients between lispatercept and erythropoietin called the COMMANDS study. But patients have to have the hemoglobin dropping below this and being needing blood. Thank you. The next question comes from Margaret. She was diagnosed with low-risk MDS in 2009. In 2019, she had the mutation testing. It was found to have the TP53 and TET2 mutations. Right now, she's only needing erythropoietin um, injections every week, and the disease has not progressed. Is there any way to predict how long her good luck will persist since she's already had the disease for 10 years, the oncologist chose to not change any treatment. Yeah, so that's obviously why. So yeah, like it's hard to tell. So obviously, again, the P53, typically uh, patients don't do well for a long time and the disease at least will act up, you know. So again, I first would question whether this is P53 or how big the size of that clone is. Uh, but obviously the best thing is really time and you've done well so far uh, for 10 years. So, uh, uh, I, I, you know, I, I totally agree. Like if the counts are not profoundly low, uh, then I would say, I would observe. We, I always tell the patients, there is something about the disease tempo or kinetics. Like if somebody's disease is active, those diseases are not shy, they are gonna show us. The platelets will start dropping and all that. Is there an evidence if we treat today versus waiting till the counts get worse that we change things? Probably not. So I totally agree. In some instances, we actually worry about earlier treatment so much in cases, particularly with the P53, because then you will just select, you know, the resistant cells to remain. The good cells will respond to the treatment and only the bad cells will remain. And then the disease becomes more aggressive. So I would say observation is very reasonable. Thank you. The next question is, does iron in one's diet affect a patient that has MDS with ring sideroblasts? Uh, she has a hemoglobin of 9.8 and the SF3B1 mutation. Okay. So no, the diet will not affect the iron levels much. In MDS, sometimes the body will sense that it is iron deficient, so they will increase the absorption. So the ferritin could be high, but it's nothing related to the iron we see in the MDS ring sideroblast. That's a description under the microscope of the mother cells of the red blood cells where they, there is the position of the iron around the nucleus. Sidro in Greek is iron and ring because they are like ring shaped. And that is because of a defect in the mitochondria transforming the iron and uh, that is linked to the SF3B1 now in a way, but it's nothing related to the food or diet of, uh, or like the consumption of iron. Thank you. Kate was diagnosed with MDS ring sideroblast SLD two years ago. She's taking part in an NIH natu natural history study of the germline RUNGS1 that has been passed down through their family. She also has somatic genes EZH2 and SF3B1. Does the fact of having inherited Rex1 change my chances of moving from MDS to AML? Yeah, so probably yes. Like, so the familial, the, if, if this is familial thrombocytopenia confirmed germline mutation, then the, probably yes, like there is probably a higher chance of this eventually. But again, if counts are good now and everything is fine, other than close observation, I'm not advocating to do anything. And then the other part is this SF3B1 is a good one. EZH2 is not considered as so good, but in the context of SF3B EZH1, the SF3B1 is not also as good as normal. So, but again, nothing indicates that you have to go and do anything now. I would say close observation, it's good that you're on the natural history study. When things act up, obviously will act based on that. Thank you. 
The next question comes from George. He was diagnosed with high-grade MDS with the IDH2 mutation. He was transplanted in July of last year. He wants to know if he should have the IDH2 mutation tested, given that there are no firm data on the results of ongoing clinical trials. Tested or treated with IDH inhibitor, like, so, yeah, like uh, testing the mutation would be part also if you've had a transplant to show that you are in what we call a minimal residual disease or undetectable abnormality. The deeper the response, the better. If you still have the IDH mutation, then there is some abnormality there. And an IDH2 is very targetable mutation and sensitive to many different treatments. So they may act a little bit based on that. So I will get it tested for sure uh, to see if it is gone after the transplant. That's a good thing. Now, what you know, we test in the clinic is not a true minimal residual disease because those platforms that I discussed earlier today, the next generation sequencing, their threshold is 5%. So once the mutation is below 5%, it's not detectable. But still, even with that fact, if you become NGS negative, you do better after transplant. Thank you. The next question comes from John. Is Jacopy being used for MDS or is it only used for those patients that have NPNs? It's approved by the FDA for myelofibrosis. We've done studies uh, in the consortium that we've led in patients with a disease called CMML. That's a hybrid between MDS and MPN, chronic myelomonocytic leukemia, where patients can have manifestations similar to myeloproliferative diseases. They could have big spleen, uh, high white count, uh, constitutional symptoms with drenching night sweats, fever, et cetera. And for that, we are testing it and we're moving for the second phase and testing it. So even in that setting, it's investigational. Um, so there is no FDA approval, but you could get access to it in the CMML through a clinical trial. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question from Marion. She has high-risk MDS and TP53 mutation and has been on Bidesa for five years. And then she started Dacogen for the past eight months. The Dacogen was at a half dose over a six week period, but they have stopped it at this time because the treatment was doing more harm than good. She also has other comorbidities. Um, she has systemic lupus. What do you think her options will be going forward? Her blast counts are less than 5%. Again, so, so what I tell also every year, like I should have said from the beginning, this is just like a general guidance because in reality, I really have to know the details of any case. So I don't want to do anything bad or harm. So I'm just saying in general, what my approach would be, uh, this is not you know a medical consultation in, per se. Uh, it, it's hard to tell because I don't know, like first, like you've done well, with that P53, which again, so we question a little bit the P53, but we do see patients every now and then they do well with that. I don't know what was the indication originally to pull off the treatment with the Videza. Why did they shift to the Dacogen? If you have low blasts now, was that made by the Dacogen or not? If the Dacogen brought the blasts down, then that's a good thing. And then maybe maintaining on a way, but if the blasts were low and the counts are low and you've done the Dacogen for eight months and it's not improving the blood counts, it's not working. So I would stop, reevaluate the disease, maybe take a break a little bit, and then again, assess what is needed for the treatment. Like what, what low blood counts are there, uh, what options. Many times after Daxin Videza, options are limited and it may come to time of clinical trial. But again, there is so many details that unfortunately I can't give you a straight answer or a recommendation. Thank you. Unfortunately, that's all the time that we have for questions. Thank you, Dr. Kamrakji, for your wonderful presentation and your time and effort that went into preparing for this webinar. And thank you all for attending today and for your great questions. For those of you who still have questions, please feel free to reach out to me at ahassan at mds-foundation.org. If you missed out or would like to revisit this webinar, be on the lookout for an email that will provide you with a link within 10 business days. On behalf of the NDS Foundation, thank you for joining us. This concludes today's program.